Bonjour, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lucy Sacco, and this is Master Artist Class, a program designed to introduce master artists from the late 19th and early 20th centuries by offering a brief lecture on the artist's lives and their painting styles, a segment with images of each master artist's works, and lastly, we will paint our own rendition of one of the featured artist's paintings. In today's episode, we will be studying Pierre-Auguste Renoir, who was born on February 25, 1841, in Limoges, France. He came from humble beginnings with a tailor and seamstress for parents and was the youngest of six children. When he was five years old, his family moved to Paris, France, near the Louvre. As a teenager, Renoir became an apprentice for a porcelain painter where he first learned to paint designs on plates and dishware. He also, at this time, took drawing lessons at a city-sponsored art school. At 19, Renoir began copying master works at the Louvre, where he also met Claude Monet, Frederick Bazile, and Alfred Sisley. Through Monet, he became acquainted with Camille Pissarro and Paul Cezanne. He once said, I was a very diligent student. I ground away in the academic way, but never obtained the slightest mention, and my professors were unanimous in finding my painting wretched. In 1870, Renoir was enlisted in the Army. When the war ended in 1871, he was released, and he joined his Impressionist colleagues to participate in and curate an Impressionist exhibition the name Impressionist was meant to demean this form of painting by an art critic at the time, but Renoir would be one of the foremost leaders of the movement and enjoyed the lighter and more vibrant nature of the Impressionist style of painting. He eventually was able to acquire commission work that funded his travels to Algeria, South France, and Naples, Italy, where he painted a series of paintings, Dance in the Country, Dance in the City, Dance in Bourgeval. As Renoir aged, he became stricken with arthritis and suffered a stroke which caused him to be wheelchair bound. He painted until his death in 1919 and was even able to see one of his works purchased by the Louvre, a great honor for the artist. During his life, he had a profound influence on famous modern artists such as Matisse and Picasso. Today, we will be painting a still life painting known as Still Life with Pears and Apples. Renoir was known mostly for his realistic painting of flesh in his portraits. He developed this through first in the creation of fruit still life paintings and lavish landscapes using many different blurred soft brush strokes. Please view the upcoming segment filled with the magical, lush, and vibrant paintings of the Impressionist master artist, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Enjoy. Thank you. 
Today we're going to be painting a still life painting, one of many that Pierre Auguste Renoir did. He was known for his flesh, uh, painting of human flesh, and he just made it look so realistic and touchable. And um, he, he did this by practicing on fruit still life. So today, we're going to get an idea of how that goes. Um, it's still life with pears and apples. So let's get to work. So this is one of the more simple paintings that I do. It's one of the first paintings I ever introduced to people. Um, simply because it holds some keys, key knowledge about how to paint something to look a little bit realistic. Um, today we have a pretty simple palette. We might have maybe 10 colors, maybe, but you could keep it down to maybe four or five colors. Um, I'm going to start with a background color that is uh, sort of covered up a little bit. I've got my three-quarter inch flathead brush. And I'm just going to put it uh, in the places that I see where it is on the copy. And it looks a little bit stained in the background, like it's an old plaster wall with shadows on it. Um, you know, the Impressionists, they used the primary colors. And when they wanted to make shadows, they used the complementary color of the primary color. So in other words, if you have a red apple, you use green for your shadow. If you have a blue wall, you might use a little orange or umber, uh, amber color to make it look like a shadow. Um, so now that I've put that down, pretty simply, uh, I noticed that Renoir's painting style is very dry. He used very little paint, and uh, it's not watery, is all I can say. It's not, but and yet it's still very soft, and um, you know, it's sort of, uh, it looks touchable. I once did a, uh, I'm using a medium cadmium yellow right now, and I'm mixing a little bit of raw sienna with it. Um, I once did a uh, uh, talk about Sterling and Francine Clark, and they loved Renoir, and they have several pieces up at the Clark Art Institute. Uh, and I remember reading that uh, Sterling Clark once said that he'd rather have 10 Renoirs than 100 Degas. <laughs> he really liked uh, Renoir. And you know, it's such an interesting style because when you get up close, and this is the way it is with all Impressionistic painting. I mean, every single Impressionist painting. If you get up close to an Impressionist painting, it looks like a mess. 
It's all scribbly. You can see every scratch and every brush mark. And, um, and then, you know, you step back and it looks very realistic. And part of the reason is because of the coloring. They didn't use black or browns or any heavy colors. They just used the light palette of the primary colors and um, that's it. So now I'm going to move into the uh, tablecloth. So there's a tablecloth back here. And I'm going to go ahead and put my primary color here in here. I've got a uh, unbleached titanium, it's called. And it's kind of like a putty stone color, like a light creamy color. And, you know, the tablecloth looks sort of uh, old. And I don't know if it's because of the painting or if it's because the tablecloth actually had a very linen sort of feel to it. Looks like one of those old Italian paint uh, tablecloth with the red. There's like a little red trim along the edges. Now, the fruit, I'm going to paint most of the fruit with a bright yellow. Bright yellow, uh, deep cadmium yellow. I'm going to paint the pear. And one, two, three, four, five. So there's five pieces of fruit that are that color. The others are going to be something else, a different color. This painting is not going to take long. I'll tell you that right now. It's going to be a little bit refreshing from the Van Gogh paintings, that the series of Van Gogh paintings that we just did. Uh, they were very intense. Now, not because I don't, I'm not paying a lot of attention to the details of this painting. It's just that it's a, sim it's a more simplistic style, I think. And yet, it is a little bit complex, too, because, I mean, it's so soft looking, even though it's a little bit dry. You're using a dry brush. So there's a lot of variables to it, a lot of dimension. So now I'm putting a cadmium, a medium cadmium red on these other apples. And there's also some of that color. I'm using my three quarter inch brush probably should use a different brush right now. I'm going to rinse it off. I mean, I probably could do the whole thing with the same brush, but let's check. Let's switch it up. So I've got my half-inch uh, tapered brush, and I'm using cadmium red. And I'm going to just, I'm going to take most of the paint off of the brush. Just dab it on the palette, and you can take most of it off. Okay, so I'm just kind of Dragging it along the outside of the pear. We spoke about how in drawing and in painting, many times, many artists know that there's basic three colors. So you've got your middle color. And that would be the yellow. And then you've got your shadow. And that would be the cadmium. And maybe a little green on the side. Um, and then you're going to have a highlight. So, and those, that technique makes things look very realistic. It just does. Because it creates the dimension that you need. And 
It's just very believable. So now I've got a little bit of a stem. I don't want to, this is a big brush for this, but I'm still using it because it's uh, very sharp and I can articulate what I want to paint very detailed with this tapered brush. I love my tapered brush. What can I say? Isn't it wonderful that it's finally spring? Oh, so happy. It's my favorite season. <laughs> I love spring. We get to jump outside and walk and run. It's just really beautiful in the Berkshires too, all the flowering trees. So I've got, I'm going to keep putting on my red, my cadmium red. I'm going to stick with one color at a time for now. Make sure that I've got very meager amount on my brush. Now you want to make sure it's a lot easier to get your highlight if you don't put on a thick layer of paint. At least in this in this painting because it's just several layers. It's lots of thin layers in this painting. That's what he did. So with flash, he would put down like a light blue. Yeah, believe it or not. Or you put down a green and then you put another color over the top of that and that color shows through and it turns into like a luminous effect. And that's how he painted his flesh on his portraits that he did. So I'm going to do this little apple here, or peach, whatever it happens to be. It must be an apple because it's pears and apples. <laughs> okay, yeah, that looks pretty good. Very light. I'm holding my brush very lightly like a baby bird. That's how we hold this brush. So we're going over here now with the cadmium. Don't be heavy handed. This guy had a real light touch. And that could be why his paintings were so effective. Um, he was well liked. He was a well loved artist. Many people loved him. And it was his personality. And it really showed through. Now I'm just dabbing this. I'm not dragging my brush because chances are that's going to cause me to go off the, the rendering. Like I'm going to go outside of the line and I don't want to do that. So I can dab it and that will make it a more accurate round shape. So I guess there's a glaze of this on this yellow apple in the middle. There's just a, the slightest hint, I don't know, maybe like a honey crisp or something. <laughs> just the lightest, well, Probably didn't have honey crisp apples back then. I don't know. I never heard of honey crisp apples until like recently. I don't know where they come from, but uh, that's what this one looks like. I'm very lightly. You can see I'm barely touching the uh, paper very lightly. And you know, a lot of times 
certain kinds of apples, they get a little bit red as they get riper. So I guess that's what's happening here. You'll see in the, uh, the video portion of his works in that segment of this um, program, you'll see how soft and blurry his brush strokes are in the, um, the landscape. And even in the portraits, a lot of the portraits are very, very, I'm using a deep green now, using a deep green, uh, hooker green, I guess. I'm going to use that. And that's the shadow on this dark red apple back here. And then there's some kind of little bit of a green fruit back here. I'm going to do that. You know, if you make a mistake with acrylics, you could just wash it off. You know, it's simple. And I see a little tiny bit of green on some of these other apples, like up here. There's a little something going on here. I'm just going to. If you get green on your hands, make sure you wash your hands because even though these are student paints, they're non toxic. Uh, they're student grade, and uh, but I always wash my hands because um, well, it doesn't look great for one reason, but the other reason is because green has different stuff in it, different chemicals. Um, so you don't want to ingest it or get it into your mouth or anything. These are student grade, but they're not made for eating. <laughs> You can't make a meal out of it. Okay. You know, it's so simple, this painting. It's not going to be much longer either. Um, let's see, I've got a little bit of alizarin crimson. A little bit of alizarin crimson. And I'm going to go ahead head up here and I'm going to add some shadowing with this. When you come out with a painting of fruit like you're going to have when you finish this, I promise you you will feel really good about your painting skills. So I did not paint that middle part there, nor did I paint the, where the stem is. And that kind of gives it a three-dimensional effect. So these fruit now are starting to come, up, come out a little bit three-dimensional, three-dimensional. Okay, so hmm. now the background. So the background, well, you can mostly see the rendering here, but that is like a pain gray, which is a deep, deep blue. Pain gray is not really gray or it's kind of a lively color, even though it's called pain gray not really sure why it's called that either. But let's do this, OK? Just go ahead and go. None of these uh, brush strokes back here, by the way, are up and down. They're just uh, very randomly put on the background here. Uh, it's that you want your brush strokes to show up. It doesn't want to be a flat, one-dimensional background. 
this is sort of indicative. You want your brush strokes to show up. It's indicative of shadows on this old wall. And uh, just adds a lot of interest to your painting. You want your brush strokes to show up. And it doesn't matter if it matches exactly. Um, actually, you know, just have fun with it. You don't want to. This is fun. This is supposed to be fun. I really enjoy doing this. And I know that it's difficult to um, paint messily, but that's what the Impressionists did. They painted messily on purpose. And they still got the effect that they were looking for, which is really, really interesting. This is uh, quite the technique. I'm just going randomly in here, not going like this, no up and down stuff really, um, all different kinds of ways. This is a lot different than Vincent van Gogh's work, which we just studied. Um, and this is very haphazard and even though he planned it this way, he planned it like this. Um, yeah, he planned it to paint it messily. <laughs> Can you believe that? People just can't believe it. So this tablecloth has a little bit of a pinkish hue to it. I'm going to take some of my cadmium red and mix it in to the unbleached titanium. And there are some shadows, some shadow, some shadows in this tablecloth. Adding a little bit more dimension and texture. You can see where the folds are and how the fabric is lying on the table. And I'm just grazing over it. I have very little paint on my brush once again. Gosh, if you ever went to the Clark Art Institute and looked at Renoir's paintings, it's just like you probably, it is, gives you the false impression that you think, oh, I can do that. I can do it. You know, that's messy. But it's a very articulate, nonetheless, very planned out, beautiful, soft. Okay, so hmm. I think I have to kind of blur some of this background in. So now I think I'll just put the finishing touches on the table, which is also a little bit of this cadmium red, a little bit of that again. I'm going to go ahead and graze over it like so. Try not to press too hard on your brush. You know, you're going to make it sort of orangey color, but. Probably a maple color, maple table.
If you feel that it's too clumpy or something, you can add a little bit of water to your brush. I'm going to add a little green and make some, you know what, burnt sienna. And I'm going to create these cracks and wood grains that are showing up here on the table. There's something going on over here. Maybe part of the tablecloth pulling away from the table a little bit. So I'm going to use Payne Gray and the tablecloth for the shadows. Try not to be too heavy handed. So, coming down to the home stretch here. Isn't that good? This is one of the most simple paintings that I've offered to people. I'm going to kind of go along up here. Now we're going to go ahead and put, I'm going to put the highlights on the fruit. And guess what? We're going to be finished. I'm going to put a little bit of highlights there. Very light, light. I'm going to step back. Okay, so it looks a little bit too illustrative for me. So I'm going to put a little bit more yellow to kind of smooth things out.
using a light, light yellow. Very light. I feel pretty good about it. If you need a list of supplies, you can go to my website, masterartistclass.com, and there will be a list of supplies there for you. There will be renderings that you can order. I'm hoping to get my books on there soon, still working on that. But um, I hope to hear from you. And I hope you had a good time. I did. Have a good day. And so long.